Hey friends, thank you so much for joining this session. I am here with one of my favorite authors, and I'm not saying this to sugarcoat him. I told him off camera already. I genuinely mean it. Donald Robertson, the author of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. You can see it's a little bit worn out already <laughs> because it's one of the books I, I read every single day. And Donald is a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, an author and a trainer, Scottish by birth, but then emigrated to Canada. And now he spends half his time in Athens, Greece. You are doing some pretty exciting stuff in, in Athens. So I would love to, to dive into that today. But your book, how to think like a Roman emperor really set the stage. And I'm glad we connected because this book has a big impact on me and how I run the business, how I deal with challenges and all that good stuff. So thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, same here, same here. Before we started recording, I, I said that stoicism comes up in conversations I have with my entrepreneur friends over and over again. And it seems that there is some magic sauce in the in this philosophy that helps entrepreneurs and business owners deal with challenges. And I would love for you to give us uh, an overview of what stoicism really is. Maybe somebody watching this already lives by stoicism without even knowing it. Yeah, there's a number of ways of describing it. So first of all, who are these guys and where does it come from? So Stoicism is a branch of Greek philosophy. It was founded in 301 BC in Athens by a guy called Zeno of Citium. And people may have heard of some of the, there were many Stoics and Stoicism flourished for about five centuries. But the Stoics that people are most likely to have heard of will be the later ones from the Roman period because it became popular later in Rome. And so they may have heard of Seneca, perhaps Epictetus, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and also a kind of honourable mention goes out to Cicero, who's one of the famous orators of antiquity. He wasn't a Stoic, but he was really into Stoicism and wrote a lot about it, so he's one of our main sources. And what did they believe? Well, Stoicism was very influ heavily influenced by a philosopher from an earlier generation called Socrates, who's the quintessential Athenian philosopher. And so they took a lot of ideas from him and really focused more than the other schools of Greek philosophy, the Stoics focused on the practical side of philosophy, on philosophy we, we can say as a therapy of the passions, as a form of psychotherapy, a means of developing emotional resilience. And their central doctrine was really a moral doctrine. It's the idea that virtue is the only true good. That's how they phrase it. But then they'll go on and say that to explain that uh, it takes a little bit of elaboration. And the, one of the main consequences of their moral philosophy happens to be that it has emotional implications if you accept that philosophy. And it seems to lead to greater emotional resilience. So one of the reasons that Stoicism is popular today is that it's the original philosophical inspiration for cognitive behavioral therapy which is how I originally get into it, because as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist by profession who happens to have a couple of degrees in philosophy. <laughs> so I, I kind of inevitably wound up looking at stoicism because that's the, well, the, the area where philosophy and psychotherapy. Yeah. Well, one thing that applies to me or that, that I appreciate about stoicism is what, what you've said already, the, the practical implications of this philosophy. I've never thought of myself as being a philosopher or studying philosophy or something, yet I find myself with your book on the table. I have Brian Holiday's The Daily Stoic right next to that on the table. And so at some point, I have to say myself that I'm a business owner and I'm a philosopher. And I know that this event is really about email marketing and list building, but I find that even when I set out an email marketing campaign, for example, there are so many challenges and so many setbacks that can happen and so many curveballs that I've throws at you sometimes that you have to have this resilience that you've mentioned. You have to know when things go wrong, how do I deal with this? And the one concept that you elaborate in your book and that, that Marcus Aurelius originally came up with, I think, is the concept of cognitive dis distancing and then looking at an event by its parts in itself. So rather than looking at an event in a whole, you try to break it down and then is this thing bad or good or is it indifferent in itself? And this philosophy helped me personally quite a bit to deal with challenges in business. 
Yeah, there are many. I suppose I've been writing about stoicism for a long time now. It's been about a quarter of a century, about 25 years since I first became interested in it. In the first book that I wrote, I tried to provide an overview that was aimed at academic philosophers and professional psychotherapists looking at how stoicism and CBT related. And I tried to list all the psychological techniques I could find in the stoic literature. And uh, I went back afterwards. I didn't count them at the time, funnily enough. I just listed them. So I went back recently and counted it because I was editing the second edition of that book. And there were about 18 distinct psychological techniques, roughly. Wow. We can find. So they, they have not just one or two techniques, but a whole toolbox of psychological techniques, kind of cognitive behavioral techniques, we might call them, including some of the ones that you just mentioned are, are some of the key ones that the Stoics employ for coping with stress and but also managing anger, overcoming bad habits, dealing with depression, anxiety, all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. I think that especially for the entrepreneurial audience we have here, I think uh, frustration, depression, anxiety are some emotions that, that we have to go through on a regular basis with, with the roller coaster of being an entrepreneur. It, it's not. And you, you need to have this framework of, of beliefs and techniques that you don't don't go crazy about all the things yeah. that happen because sometimes yeah. you just feel like a firefighter. You're constantly yeah. putting out fires every day. I would love to hear some of the uh, more effective and more practical methodologies you think stoicism gives us entrepreneurs to cope with these situations. Well, I, I, I sympathize because I think entrepreneurs really do put themselves out there. And I'm quite serious about that. They expose themselves to uh, a lot of risk. They expose themselves to a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure. So it takes guts uh, and emotional resilience to be, and it takes psychological tools to be a successful entrepreneur, I think. One of the things that potentially would differentiate someone who's successful from someone who isn't would be in part their ability to cope with the pressure uh, and to remain focused and uh, not just to lose it when because sometimes things can get pretty hairy like when all of your, your whole livelihood's at stake and uh, your business is at stake and it's all on so that can be a lot of pressure techniques that the stoics use to cope with stress there are many and you've mentioned some already but some of the the, the I, let's start with what's perhaps the most fundamental one in my view, the single most widely quoted passage from the Stoic literature comes from a book called the Enchiridion, or the Handbook of Epictetus, and it's passage number five, and it says it's not things that upset us, <clears throat> but rather our opinions about them. And the reason that's so widely quoted is because it used to be in almost every book on cognitive behavioral therapy, because uh, cognitive therapists, in a way, they do something that is similar to public health, they have to study really intense psychological research, so it's evidence-based, and then they have to sit down with ordinary people, like random people, and somehow communicate with them about this research that's difficult to put into words. And the fundamental basis of cognitive therapy is what we call the cognitive theory of emotion. It's the idea that our thoughts and our beliefs shape the way that we feel, shape our emotions, which might seem obvious, but many people really don't grasp that initially. And if anything, the most, what I would say actually fundamentally, a deep level, a philosophical level, one of the most powerful things you can do to gain resilience is just to grasp that basic idea completely. So the way I like to explain it is that Albert Ellis, one of the pioneers of cognitive therapy, he'd sit down with clients in therapy or coaching We'll usually talk about how anxious or depressed or angry they are and how these feelings are ruining their life, causing them problems at work, damaging their relationships, maybe affecting their sleep, affecting their health. So it sounds terrible. And these are all reasons to change. But then usually the client, having kind of talked themselves into a corner, will express stuckness. So they'll go, I know this is terrible, but I can't do anything about it. it it's just how I feel. And Ellis would lean forward and smile at them at that point and say, yes, but it's not just how you feel, is it? It's also how you think. And that's what they were missing because our feelings don't just come from nowhere. They're shaped by underlying values, beliefs, attitudes. And the Stoics knew that two and a half thousand years ago and it became the basis of the philosophy. It's not 
things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. And so really grasping that is what we call cognitive distancing. And the distancing we're referring to is actually the distance between our thoughts, our beliefs, and the events that they, to which they refer. So it's creating a separation, as Marx Aurelius sometimes calls it, between our thinking and external events. So a good example would be if I say, if I lose my job and I say, geez, this is awful, it's a catastrophe, rather than just seeing it as objectively a catastrophe, as if the catastrophic nature of it is somehow out there and I'm just describing what I see. Cognitive distancing would be realizing that I'm catastrophizing the event, that uh, nature doesn't give to hoot. It's a more indifferent, like, it's just stuff yeah. that happens, but I see it as catastrophic. And someone else might view it as an opportunity or they might see it as transient, temporary uh, setback or they might see it as not as bad as it seems, as bad, but not catastrophic. Also, my future self, like 10 years from now, looking back on it, I might view it differently. I might see it actually as a, an opportunity to explore a, a new line of work or a learning experience or something like that, and not exactly uh, in the same way as a catastrophe. So cognitive distancing has also got to do with something we call cognitive flexibility. It's realizing that there might be other ways of framing or looking at the situation and loosening up the grip that our values, our beliefs have over the event. And in the early days of cognitive therapy, we used to think this was a kind of preamble, like a precursor to doing proper therapy. And then about 15, 20 years ago, the next generation of researchers realized that actually this is almost an entire therapy in itself. It's much more powerful, in fact, yeah. than people originally assumed, because simply by gaining that separation, it really dilutes the emotional effect it uh, allows us to become better at problem solving. So it's a slightly subtle technique, uh, but it's one of the most powerful techniques. And there are a number of different ways of gaining this distance, but the basic one actually is just, it comes from an insight. It comes from really understanding that our feelings are shaped by these beliefs and value judgments, and that we're projecting them onto external events and taking ownership for that and making that kind of your whole, the way to make that into an entire philosophy of life, basically. Yeah, this is such a powerful concept for me. It was, it began with thinking about self-awareness and try, trying to recognize my thoughts and my feelings be, so that I could even examine them. And one example most recently was uh, the week we are recording this interview. My doctor, uh, she's 16 months, she got to the hospital and Obviously, it was, it was my first child and due to Corona restrictions, I couldn't be with my wife and my daughter. And I heard the stories that the hospital was overloaded with work and they couldn't treat her properly and stuff. And I was sitting at home. I was freaking out mm -hmm. because, of course, I wanted to be there for my little girl and I wanted right. to protect her from all the harm. And I couldn't do anything with it. And then it took... I, I'm probably into stoicism for three years by now, and it took literally everything that I had learned so far to be able to take the step back and to just see, hey, this is what I can do. Here are the options that I have. This in itself is neither good nor bad because I cannot do anything at this point. How do I make the most out of this situation? How do I best serve my family? How do I take care that the business is still running even though I'm freaking out like a headless chicken? And the, these things, I think they start with self-awareness so that you get the, this click that, that you recognize that you are catastrophizing, that you're projecting what you've learned in the past maybe onto the future. Because when, the same, even, yeah. when a bad event happens in the past, we remember it and we think it will happen the same time again in the future. The thing was for me that I'm experiencing, it's hard to phrase this, but sometimes I'm ups upsetting people around me with this perspective because they think like I'm overly simplifying things sometimes and I, I, I don't join their train of, of emotional catastrophizing and stuff yeah. like that. So this is a challenging concept when you are around people. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's because people are all wrong about how emotions work based, to be honest. We don't really- but They don't want to hear that though. <laughs> mm, they are, no, they don't. Of course they don't want to hear that. But that's why we have psychotherapy and psychology It's because most of us are never really taught as children how our emotions work. And geez, man, it's not like we have thousands of research studies 
on how emotions function within there are things that we are discovering and then there's things that we've known for over half a century that are open secrets that are taken for granted by researchers and yet they're still not taught in schools like really basic things about the way for example the, the role that our beliefs have in shaping our emotions would be something that's kind of you know, blatantly obvious uh, to most psychologists but a, a lot of people still talk about their emotions as if they're just like they come from nowhere and they just can kind of happen to them and they don't have any control over I actually I'll let me I'll go on my hobby horse for a second and rant about something that I think is important now, this is there are many things that I would uh, I wish we could teach children so one of them is the way that we talk about emotions is in incredibly simplistic, right? Some psychologists in the past have called it the lump theory of emotion. So we talk about anger as if it's like a thing, like I've got this anger, like it kind of wells up within me. Like I'm starting to get angry, it's just anger that I've got. You're angry, it's amorphous blob of anger that we have. So it's almost like there's no attempt at all to properly dissect or analyze what our emotions consist of. And let, that's how generally people Talk about it. If you've got any interest in the psychology of emotions and you listen to people talking about their feelings, it just seems like there's, there's zero analysis. Like, it's just bleh. Like, I've just got anger. And anger takes different forms. Same as anxiety and depression. There are sensations. There are action tendencies that contribute to it. There are facial expressions that contribute to our experience of anger. There are patterns of thinking. But the most fundamental distinction that we can make, so there are many distinctions. I would say that anger, anxiety, depression, the way I tend to explain it to clients is to say, it's, imagine it's like a cake that's baked of many ingredients. It's not just like one thing. Your anger, your anxiety, your depression, it, it's a recipe that you've cooked up. Like, it's made from, there's a bit of egg, there's some flour, there's some sugar that goes into it. There are thoughts, actions, feelings that all kind of contribute in a very specific way. And also our emotions are much more fragile than we realise. Once we realise that all these ingredients, like if you put twice as many eggs in, like, and half as much sugar, you're going to get some like, really weird cake that comes out at the end of it, right? But if you change also the ingredients that go into it, your emotions change. And once you realise that, you have way more control like, over your emotions than you would normally assume. Yeah. But it starts with realising, it starts with just looking at it and realising that there are components to it. There are bits. It's not just like a big amorphous blob that you can't get a handle on. There are mechanisms and levers and processes going on. But the most basic sort of like elementary distinction that you could make is that in any given emotion, there are aspects of it that are automatic processing, as psychologists phrase it, that are involuntary or reflex. And then there are aspects of the emotional experience that are voluntary. And the Stoics really put a lot of emphasis on this distinction. You were talking about entre entrepreneurs. There are many articles written by entrepreneurs about Stoicism. And uh, so many people who in the business world are interested in Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss yeah. as kind of guides or role models in the self-improvement field. Uh, and they're both great advocates of, of Stoicism. And one of the things I've noticed is that when entrepreneurs speak about Stoicism, the bit they're most interested in isn't the, the bit that cognitive therapists are interested in. It's not uh, the cognitive theory of emotion per se. It's more what we call the dichotomy of control that they tend to talk about, this distinction between what's under voluntary control and what isn't. And uh, people think of that in terms of external events. So there's aspects of the situation that aren't under my control. And then my response to it is, but in your head, there are things that are under your control and things that aren't, right? In your anger, like in your anxiety, there are bits that you control and bits that you don't. And that distinction is fundamental to modern cognitive models of emotion, basically. Because this is going to a tiny little bit of a deep dive, but I'll do it very quickly. One of the first things that I would do with clients normally is just say, look, people tend to try too hard to control the involuntary aspects of emotion. So say they're anxious and the heart rate starts really beating fast and they start sweating and shaking. That's, those are autonomic responses. They're not really under voluntary control, not directly anyway. And people will like focus on them and try and conceal them or suppress them. They'll feel embarrassed or like, you know, second order anxiety about them. They get quite preoccupied with them. So they're like trying to control these things that are physiological reactions that they can't really control. So often people are trying too hard to control the aspects of emotion that aren't under the direct because all the research, I mean, a lot of research converges in the finding that it's better to actually accept 
those feelings with a kind of attitude of studied indifference, to put it very simply. But then people neglect to control the aspects of the emotional response that are voluntary. So that would be what you do. So whether you approach the thing that you're anxious about or whether you run away in the opposite direction or whether you cover your eyes and kind of like try and distract yourself from it or something like that, your coping responses are under voluntary control. But also the conversation that you have in your head about it. So when people are anxious, they often engage in a style of voluntary thinking that we call worrying. And to my specialism is treating anxiety disorders. One of the oddities about that is that when people worry a lot, and some people have pathological worrying. They have a condition called generalized anxiety disorder, which we sometimes call a worrying disorder. Everybody worries to some extent. Generally, people assume that worrying is involuntary, but they're, they're wrong. Like, yeah. you know, ironically, worrying is actually a voluntary cognitive process. So people have it completely back to front. They're trying to control the involuntary aspects and neglecting to control the voluntary aspects. How messed up is that? That's how completely out, like, messed up I, I, I have, emotions. yeah, so true. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I have many friends who are not entrepreneurs who don't live their best life, if I want to say it that way. And they have this attitude. They always expect the, the worst outcome of any situation. Yeah. They always expect the worst. So they're not disappointed when the worst happens. And they think they always get the upside. Because if something better happens than what they expect, they are pleasantly surprised. And th this is just so frustrating to me. But what are your thoughts on that? I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with doing that. Ex but the, when it becomes problematic is in part when people spend too much time doing it and they engage in a style of thinking that we call ruminative thinking. So that's what we call it when someone thought process kind of go round and round in a circle. People who worry pathologically might say that they feel like they're doing that almost all day long. And they often do it at inappropriate times, like when they're trying to get to sleep at night would be the classic time. That's everyone's favorite time to worry. Like entrepreneurs' favorite time to worry is like when the lights yeah. go off. How, how do I cover the bills for the next week? Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to get to sleep and your body's like, you're supposed to be shutting up right now so I can sleep. And your brain is like, yeah, but how am I going to pay the bills? And what am I going to do about this? And what if somebody sues me? And what does that Like, so we call it what if. It's a type of catastrophizing, basically. So when people engage in that, just uh, here's a little bit of technical analysis for you. They typically overestimate the severity and the probability of a threat and underestimate their coping ability. So there are several, even in terms of the, the content of the thoughts, there are several aspects to it like that have to come together in a particular balance in order to bake this. And if you changed any of those variables, the, the cake wouldn't be the same, like you wouldn't end up with worry or anxiety, you cook up some other yeah. type of emotion, it probably wouldn't be as much of a problem. The most, worry is fragile, man. Like, people don't think it is, but like, you just need to pull one little pin out and the whole thing collapses, right? Like, it's strange because oh, it's hard to stop worrying. No, it's but how do we do that though? When we are stuck in this rut, that does it take some external person to say, hey, just slow down for a minute and do something else? Or how do we do that if we're just yeah. on our own? Actually, you've hit the nail on the head in a way. The tricky part of it is more about having the self-awareness to change something in the first place. So it's much easier if you have a coach or a therapist or if you're kind of practiced in self-awareness, like mindfulness training, because you have to... It, saying it's easy to change it is one thing, but it's almost like everyone forgets to change their worrying or do anything about it. So you have to pause. But once you're paused and you've noticed what's going on, actually, there are many different things you could potentially do that would disrupt ruminative thinking. Um, so I'll give you some examples, right? Like it's really almost anything that you do that changes the process of thinking. So if you were to try worrying like while rubbing your tummy and patting your head, for instance, like, Good luck with that, yeah. Yeah, like after 30 seconds, you'd be like, geez, this is like confusing. And it's hard then to get as immersed in the anxiety as you would normally. You could still think stuff through and you could still problem solve, but you'd have greater distance from it. Like you wouldn't be as kind of fused with the, the thoughts or worrying in slow motion with pauses. Like, so if you kind of slow down your internal dialogue and pause more, often that's enough to disrupt it. And also sometimes what we often do actually is get clients to speed things up. So we'll take one sentence. It was a psychologist called Tichenor that discovered this phenomenon, by the way, at the start of the 20th century, but he didn't realize how it could be used clinically. 
that was only really discovered over the past 20 years or so. So what Titchener discovered is that if you repeat a short phrase or a word really quickly, it starts to feel meaningless. If somebody is saying, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I think we'll go and eat worms, and they're getting really depressed thinking about that or anxious or whatever, we might get them just to repeat it really fast out loud for 45 seconds, time them with a little stopwatch. So they go, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, 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 nobody likes me, everybody hates me. And like, that's five seconds, you know, already it starts to feel awkward and weird. If you do it for 45 seconds, it really starts to feel like strange. And you could still then have a conversation about the idea that nobody likes you, but you do it with a greater sense of detachment from it. Like yeah. We call that uh, verbal diffusion is the term that's usually used in behavioral psychology. That technique has a 90% success rate like, in experimental settings. Like It's so robust. It's one of the most kind of robust little kind of tactics that we can uh, use. Some techniques have a 50-50 success rate that we use in, in clinical practice, and then other ones have like a 70, 80, 90% uh, success rate, at least in changing wow. the way that, that people feel yeah. about their thoughts. I mean, also what I find, I just sometimes or anything you change, like you could say, stand on one leg and worry, or you could say to somebody, have you tried worrying in a Scottish accent? Like, <laughs> which really that even I, works I, I, lo- I love how you make it more playful. Yeah. How, how you how just make it more fun. Yeah, I, I have this theory, no one agrees with me. I, don't, I, find, I find it hard to do a Scottish accent. Like, I think if I try to think about it too much, then I start to sound like Sean Connery instead or something like that. But if you, the, the point is, you mentioned earlier, it's noticing. If you, the trick really, the underlying trick is anything that causes you to slow down and make, pay more attention to the process of thinking itself will lead to this phenomenon that we call cognitive distancing or verbal diffusion. And that tends to weaken the emotional impact of the thoughts that you're having. So you can still have the thoughts, but you won't be as engrossed in them and they won't yeah. have the same impact on you. So, I, I do that verbal diffusion technique with Texas later tonight. <laughs> good idea, yeah. And it's kind of fun to do, and it's pretty quick and easy. Jeez, man, yeah. Freud had people for five hours a week for an average of five years, right? That's like hundreds and thousands of hours of therapy. But actually, some of the most effective techniques that we have work really in, the mat- in a matter of minutes or less than a minute. But one of the things is that it, the, a bit of self-discipline is usually required because people, I don't know, almost don't believe that it can be that easy to change how they feel about things. And it's usually, get, if you have a therapist, they would just tell you to do it, and, you, and people do it, and they go, oh, yeah, I feel different now. But with self-help, people require a little bit more self-motivation to do it. They're going to think, it sounds kind of weird, standing here in a room and repeating, nobody likes me, nobody likes me, nobody likes me, over and over, yeah. like, I feel like a weirdo doing that. So a lot of people won't try things like that, but which is a shame because if you do them, you actually find that they can be quite effective. Another, yeah. I, I, I'll, you know, I'll just throw out another couple of quick techniques to show you how easy therapy is, right? Yes, please do. Yeah, I love it. So we, we talked a little bit um, about, we alluded earlier, I think, to the view from above, which is another stoic technique. The, the stoics were 100% right that when people are highly emotional, they tend to narrow their scope of attention down. So you can think about several things at once. You could be driving your car, talking to your kids in the back seat, thinking about what you're going to have for dinner and listening to the radio all at the same time. You can walk and chew gum. Like, so we can pay attention to multiple things, except when you're stressed, except when you're an entrepreneur like, and you're under a lot of stress and your brain will then naturally narrow your scope of attention down. And we do something that's, for instance, sometimes called threat monitoring. So your brain narrows its scope down like a magnifying glass and it'll look for potential signs of danger in your environment, which is helpful if you're a little furry animal and you're out on the plains and you see a predator on the horizon, you might want to boom, narrow your focus of attention down and watch that thing on the horizon like a hawk to see whether it's going to head in your direction or not. But when you're lying in bed at night, it's a really unhelpful thing to do, right? Because it magnifies threats and it distorts them because by doing that, you ignore context, which very often would have implications for the, the social meaning of a, a threat that we're facing. So the Stoics were right that by expanding the scope of our attention, we can down or dilute our emotional response to threat and see them more realistically by placing them back in a, a broader context. And they thought we should practice that every day. But one way of doing that, we could do it spatially, we could do it chronologically. One easy technique is, say somebody says that they had a relationship breakup. They're worried that their girlfriend is going to dump them. 
or, or vice versa. Some of them might they're worried that they're, they're going to get divorced or the boyfriend's going to break up with them or whatever. So a therapist, an easy technique would be to say, okay, suppose your girlfriend dumps you, what's probably going to happen next? So when people catastrophize, they focus on a slice of time, like uh, editing a movie. They go, this like little segment where I imagine her slamming the door and walking out or whatever. It's like the worst part of it. But you have to ask from a philosophical perspective, why would you only focus on that time slice and not what happens in the weeks that follow? Like, it's completely arbitrary what segment of yeah. time you focus on. But we do it in a, such a selective way, it's bound to amplify the distress and make us feel like we can't cope because we're not visualizing coping. So we have a low appraisal of coping ability and a high appraisal of the severity of the threat. That makes us freak out. Every, every time when a project goes wrong or when a client cancels or something, you are in this situation as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Every single time. And so you say, what's probably going to happen next? And that forces people to expand their chronological perspective. And they go, oh, well, I'd feel really depressed. And I'll sit at home and I'll cry. And they go, then what's probably going to happen next? Well, I'll just kind of mope around for a while and I'll feel demo. And then probably what's going to happen next? So you just keep repeating this question to keep pushing people forward and forward. And they go, I guess I'll start going out and socialize and maybe. And then what's probably going to well, I guess I'll eventually I'll meet somebody else. And then what's probably going to happen? I guess things will move on and I'll feel different and all that. So that does two things. It broadens the perspective so that it dilutes it's the intensity of the original experience they're focusing on and also forces them to mentally rehearse ways that reduces their appraisal of the severity and increases their appraisal of the coping ability just by repeating the question what's probably going to happen next over and over again i used to train therapists for a living like and there are some techniques in therapy you could literally literally train a monkey to do and therapists get paid lots of money to do this stuff right now i a lot of stuff that therapists do is quite nuanced and difficult like it's hard and it's difficult to research to read and stuff like but like any profession there's also bits of it that you could literally train, train a chimpanzee to do like or a parrot or something you could probably train a pigeon to do it right just about like so basically just go well, we'll probably what's probably going to happen next enough time in many cases allow somebody to completely change their cognitive appraisal of a situation and stop worrying and, and cope better with it. And that's something that entrepreneurs could do as well, really easy. Yeah, that, that is a great point. It reminds me of this marketing strategy that when, when you break down the pain points of customers that you want to solve, you ask why five times, like mm -hmm. why is it a problem for them? Why, why? So you dive deep into the problem. It's essentially the same thing. You just, from what I understand is you remove the, the lethargy from the situation and you propel yourself forward because what's next what next is forces you to think about a future outcome and in that situation where, when the client just broke up on you or a project yeah. failed or you have to refund a big chunk of money you get ensued you just focus on the issue at hand and you are not able to move forward constructively and a similar technique which is also pretty easy to do by a cousin to that is just to say five years from now or 10 years from now, looking back on this event, how would you feel about it? And of course, most people are going to feel less distressed. They're going to be able to appraise things more objectively. It also forces them to think a lot about how they would move on from it or cope. And like, again, like I'm, I reckon probably given enough time, I could train a pigeon to do that. Like you can, yeah. it, all you have to do is imagine like five years from now, looking back on the event, And I, that's a very powerful technique. It's something that I use a lot. I think we can learn a lot from our own lives, from our own experience, as long as we kind of approach it in the right way. I think as you get older, like one or two things happens. Either you, you just don't learn anything, like, because you don't make the effort to, like, or as you get older, you're more reflective and you think, what did I learn from my life so far? Like, when I look back on it, and a good question to ask yourself is, what happened to all the stuff that you used to really worry about? I remember, all like, think of all the time and effort that you spent over the years worrying about stuff. Like, how much of it actually happened? Like, and if it did happen, was it as bad as you anticipated? How helpful was the worrying? Like, sometimes maybe the worrying helped. What percentage of the time did the worrying actually help you? And did you have to worry as much as you actually did? Almost everybody looking back over the course of life will think, well, like, nah, most of the worrying was just a waste of time. It just, it just was unnecessary misery. Like, either the thing just didn't happen at all or it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be or the worrying just didn't help anyway. You could figure that out yourself, right? But yeah. the, I guess the meta thing is, are you willing to very calmly just look back on your own life experience 
right, and learn from it. This is why therapists, we get kind of opinion out because we see thousands of clients and we watch what the clients say to us and do. And we see the ones that are getting better. Like, and the clients that get better in coaching or therapy often are doing really simple things like this. Like, and so, again, one day we're going to figure this all out as a society and we'll start teaching our kids how to cope better with their emotions. Ho and learn hopefully, their yeah. Hopefully. One of the biggest shifts that I made in, in my daily business routine is just setting aside time to reflect. I, I'm yeah. in business for 11 years now and for the first nine probably, I was just constantly push, 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 full throttle pedal to the metal every day. And I thought I was too busy to think about this mm -hmm. stuff, to learn about this stuff. And it wasn't until I hired a mentor who said, hey, slow down. And the reason I hired a mentor is because I knew I was going to be a dad and I wanted to balance life and business better. And at, at that point, I was forced to, to assess what I was doing and whether that was moving me and the family in the right direction or not. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who aren't willing to make that trade-off to set aside like e even 10 minutes a day? I think, again, there's many things that I could say about that, actually. But one of them is there's a quote in Marcus Aurelius where he talks about how most of the stuff that we say and do in life is unnecessary and most of our, our thinking is unnecessary. Just, he used to say, many, there are many techniques in the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, but so one of them is to observe what you're doing and he would say, just ask yourself, is this necessary? And he says, to clarify, this is a kind of shorthand, what he means is, does it actually contribute to your fundamental goal in life? Now, then you need to think, what is your fundamental goal in life? Like, and this thing that I just spent the last hour doing, does it actually contribute to it? Is it irrelevant to it? Or does it actually take me in the opposite direction from it? Like, and it, most people don't do that at all. Like, again, it's yep. such a simple thing just to go, the thing that you're doing right now, the thing that you just spent the last hour doing, is it taking you towards your goal or away from it? Or is it doing nothing? Like, and when you do that, it, it's quite dramatic. For example, I'll often ask clients to work on their values and goals. And uh, when I, one of the first questions I'll ask them once we've clarified their values is how much time in minutes did you, or hours, did you spend yesterday or over the past three days or over the past week actually doing stuff in the service of your, your fundamental values? And uh, the most common answer that I get to that is zero minutes. Yeah. Which shocked me at first. That's a shocking thing to say. This is the most important thing in life to me. How much time have I spent on it over the last week? Like zero minutes. And you think there has to be a way that you could spend at least two minutes like on the thing that you reckon is the most important thing in the universe. Like there's something wrong if you, the answer to that question is zero. Like, and usually it, it's not that difficult to get people to find time in their day once they realize that. And we mentioned earlier worrying. Most people worry to some extent and usually worrying is pointless. When clients come into therapy that are coaching, the most common reason they have for not doing homework assignments is they'll often say, well, I didn't really have time to fill out these CBT forms or whatever. So techniques that help people to stop worrying, they'll create. I'll say to clients, you're going to have a problem if you do this properly, because you're going to be stuck thinking, what am I going to do with all the free time that I've got in my hands now that I'm not <laughs> worrying? Like, I go, well, how much time do you spend worrying? I don't know, like a couple of yeah. hours every... What are you going to do like, when you stop worrying? Because at the moment, that's filling up a lot of your time. There is a theory. One of the leading researchers on, on worry is a guy called Tom Borkovic. And he has this slightly technical research-based model of the cognitive avoidance model of worry. Basically, the bottom line is that people, when they worry, believe that they're facing their fears. They go, I'm worrying about my problems. But the paradox is, I, worry is an ironic, a paradoxical process, because actually, on close inspection, it seems to be more a way of avoiding confronting problems. It's more avoidant than most people realize. They trick themselves, they dupe themselves into feeling as if they're confronting their problems, when in fact they're doing it in such a way that they never really confront their problems in a concrete and sustained manner. Like they kind of skim around the edges 
like they're peeking around, like when they're worrying, but not really just confronting things in a, a more patient and sustained uh, way. And yeah. when you do that, it's painful to face up to your problems and really visualize how bad things could get. But the pain doesn't last that long normally. And usually you get over it. Whereas uh, it would be like ripping off a Band-Aid to really confront the problems. But worrying is like picking at the Band-Aid over, uh, over and over and just keeping the pain going permanently like at a lower ebb. That's what it's like, basically. And it wastes a huge amount of time and energy. Yeah. You would that, have that is... more time so, on your hands. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So don't, didn't want to interrupt. No, I was just going to say, if you eliminated worry, you would have far more time on your hands. And the techniques that, that benefit people, it's small changes often have big consequences if they're strategic. And so maybe people may only need to do things that take less than five minutes each day in order to really benefit themselves. It doesn't have to take a, a really long time. Most people, I, or I'll talk to clients and I'll say, maybe if they ever watch television, why can't you do this during the commercial breaks on TV? Like, why can't you do this instead of checking social media? A good strategy that's derived from a, a famous behavioral psychology principle called Premax principle is to say to yourself, if there's something that you do frequently throughout the day, it could be anything, right? Some, it could be scratching your backside. It could be, you know, anything that you do frequently throughout the day. It could be checking your emails, or social media, or whatever. If you want to introduce a new habit, one way of doing that is to say, to introduce a strict rule that says, I'm only allowed to check social media if I do 20 press-ups first or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You say to yourself, I can check my social media as much as I want, but every time I do it, I've got to do 20 press-ups first. And so you make a rule that you have to do the new habit that you're trying to install first before you're allowed to do the old habit that you already engage in. Yeah, you're, you're, you're connecting something new with something that's already there, yeah. yeah. I do that quite a bit when I get when I catch myself going down this mental rabbit hole sometimes. What I like to do is a technique called box breathing. It, it's I came across on YouTube, I, I think Jocko Willink, where, where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, breathe out four seconds and hold. And it's just what we said earlier, it's interrupting this, this thinking pattern, this thought pattern, and it's just putting me back into a state where I get out of this worrying and I'm ready to attack whatever is in front of me. And because I know that technique comes from Navy SEALs, I feel even more engaged in that. Uh -huh. And th this is the differentiating factor I see in many conversations with entrepreneurs way more successful than I am is they don't obsess about problems. They accept that the challenge is there and they go straight at it. Instead you said of something very interesting adding. there actually, which is knowing that it comes from Navy SEALs makes a difference. So again, like life is all about illusions. It's like life is about like, the magician who's got you looking over here, where actually he's doing something over here with his other hand. So people always look in the wrong place in order to, to solve their problems. And I said earlier, when they're dealing with their emotions, it's not like they'll focus on the wrong aspect of their emotion if they just focus on another part of it. Like they, they probably find it quite easy to resolve. Now, I trained therapists for many years trained life coaches around a training school for them. Everybody always wants to know what all the techniques are. But we have many techniques that we know quite well. The, I mentioned earlier, the key thing is the motivation to use them, actually. Like, and where does that come from? It comes from a number of sources, but one of them is uh, social proof, you might say. Jocko Willink does it, Navy SEALs do it. They're like, maybe it's worth giving this a go, right? Maybe yeah. the motivation is actually more important than the choice of individual. As long as it's a reasonably sensible take. That bit like saying that you're taking up exercise. So if you take someone who's a couch potato, does it, maybe it doesn't matter what martial art they do that much. As long as it's kind of reasonably sensible choice. Maybe it doesn't matter that much what type of uh, circuit training they, they do exactly, right? Within reasonable limits. But the key thing is just whether they're actually motivated to do anything in the first place. Like the main variable might be whether they actually feel that they can commit to doing something. And so in many cases, you might find a technique that's non-optimal, but as long as somebody actually is motivated to do it, that might be better than having a technique that's optimal, but the individual doesn't feel convinced by or doesn't feel like an attraction to, they don't have the same motivation about it. So often in therapy, we know this works, we know that works from experiments. 
but matching the technique to the client is also important. You said that the Navy SEALs, one advantage of working with groups of people is, I'll give you, I'll tell you a little story. I, I worked on a research project for the Department for the Environment in the UK, DEFRA, on noise-related stress. So people that had stress because of noisy neighbours or power stations humming and things like that, and they couldn't sleep and stuff. So I had a group of them in Harley Street and I gave them just like a bog standard relaxation CD. And this group of people are often quite, have a sense of hopelessness. They've been troubled for many years, tried everything, nothing works, mantra. Um, and so I gave them all a CD. And the next uh, week that I saw them, I said, how did you guys get on with the CD? And the first couple of people I spoke to, they said, oh, I didn't actually try it because they didn't have the motivation or the confidence to even give it a go. And I knew if they did, it would probably help them. But one, the youngest member of the group, said, oh, it was amazing. It's the best sleep that I've ever had. Like, next week, everyone had, because nobody ever listens to the expert. Like, nobody wants to listen to the therapist. But social proof, like, if there's somebody else in the group that's just like them, you're just like me. And you did the thing and it worked for you. So maybe it would work for me too. So then yeah. they have the motivation to do it. So that one of the puzzles is again, looking in the wrong, often we have plenty of techniques. We, we've got a whole toolbox of techniques and there are like, there are loads of awesome techniques to choose from. Take your pet, the trick is actually having the motivation to put them into practice consistently. And sometimes that's the real challenge is like, how do you tap into that motivation and find it like within yourself to have a goal at doing something that, that might feel a little bit different. Yeah, makes me think about Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. Rule number two is care for yourself as if you were responsible for it or something like that. Is the, the notion is we care for everybody else. If our dog gets prescribed medicine, we make sure they take it. Yeah. But if we get prescribed medicine, 30% of people don't take it, just as you said, because we don't think we are worth of being cared for as if we were caring, as if we were caring for somebody we love. And I think... It's just, he, he brought it, broke it down very clearly and eloquently and related it back to the upbringing of humanity and so on. But you, you've just made the point there in that we have to care for ourselves first so that we can then care for everybody else, essentially. That's how I see it. I think so. I, I think that's a very good paradigm. There's a lot of things that Jordan Peterson says that I think are really good. And then there's other things that he says that I think are pretty off the wall. Like, to be honest, I think he's probably one of the most hit and miss self-help authors that I've yeah. ever read. But yeah, like, I, I totally agree with him about that paradigm, that idea that therapy self-improvement is, you could, it's an old idea that it's about learning to repair in ourselves. Or as we say in therapy, the job of the therapist or the clinician is to make themselves. So my job when I'm working with a client is to get to the point where they say, I don't really need you anymore. Why? Because I've got them to the point where they're their own coach. They've become their own therapist. Like a good therapist is always trying to put themselves out of a job, basically. And they should be confident about doing that. They're going to have the most impact with a client if they approach it. Like they're thinking, they have a kind of exit strategy from therapy, as it were. Right? And they're kind of thinking, how can I get this client to the point where they just don't need therapy anymore? Like they don't need me anymore. Like they can, they can do everything for themselves that I can do for them. And, but then you have to be willing to take that level of responsibility for yourself. Like you're managing yourself, uh, being a parent to yourself or a friend to yourself. I, the way I tend to think of it in a sense is actually about friendship. If you really loved yourself, if you liked yourself, if you were uh, a friend to yourself, then you slow down and yeah. you judge things in a more balanced and a slightly more cautious way. Sometimes you might think I have to be cruel to be kind with myself. Like sometimes maybe I need to go and go a little, a little bit easier on myself. Like I think actually, and this might seem like a strange thing to say, as I said earlier, there are opportunities in life and they can benefit people enormously. Although many people that just watch the street over them. One of them is just being alive long enough. All right. So I don't think wisdom comes from experience. I think wisdom comes from experience combined with reflection, right? But as you get older, you do have this huge wealth of experience. You've met, you meet more and more people. Like, and you could learn from that if you're smart. But most people, I think, just sail through life and don't really learn anything much from their experience. So in many cases, they don't. But one of the things you can learn from, I really believe, is having kids. 
Oh, yes. So, yeah. yeah. So you have a child. And I, I say that because we also use this strategy in therapy. We say if someone's like beating up on themselves, for example, we might say, what advice would you give your daughter if she was in this situation? And usually that forces people to switch perspective and to think, okay, I guess I'm handling this badly. I, I wouldn't recommend that my daughter handle it in the same way. I tell her to do this instead. But geez, man, if that works, just imagining it from that perspective, what if you actually have it and you actually are thinking Changes about the everything. advice that you would give them, hopefully, like, it makes you a tad more responsible like, and thoughtful. And then maybe you could apply that. I, you, now I think much more easily about all the advice that I have given my daughter. And I think, geez, maybe I should be following that advice myself. So it gives me a kind of reference point. If you really care about someone else and you're more thoughtful, more reflective about the advice that you give them, or the way that you interact with them, maybe when they're emotional or upset, you can transfer those skills onto your self-care as well. You might learn something useful about managing your own emotions by doing that. But it's an opportunity not everybody benefits from. But if you're ready to benefit from having a child and learning from the experience, it could be one of the most enlightening experiences in life yeah definitely and as much as i would love to continue this conversation we are already at 55 minutes roughly and i i need to bring you back for another interview because i i just yeah. think there's so much more that we need to talk about but unfortunately we need to wrap up here at, at this point if there were one Advi one piece of advice that you can give to entrepreneurs to make the most out of their situation, to cope with stress as good as they can, what would that be? If I was to give them the fundamental stoic piece of advice, it would be realize or question the prevailing values of the society in which you live, because maybe they're toxic, right? Maybe we are born into a society, and throughout history, we, we've been, society has gravitated towards materialistic, hedonistic, egotistical, consumerist, celebrity culture, all this stuff that we on reflection know is, it's not really what life is about, but it's so easy to get sucked into it. It's on TV, like it's in the movies, we're surrounded by it. And so the really fundamental thing, I think, is to have this revolution like in our moral values, like realizing like that life isn't about having the biggest car or like getting the biggest round of applause or having the most followers on social media. Like life is all about the way that you live it and it's about your attitude towards it and it's character based, as the Stoics would say. Character is destiny. Like it's about having courage and integrity, being able to look yourself in the mirror and have a sense of pride in the person that you actually are is more valuable than any material possessions or any external acclaim you could hope for. And I think the Stoics thought, this is hard. It's like a U-turn. We have to wrench ourselves these prevailing values and learn to have more enlightened philosophical values in life. But if we could do that, it's that perspective that grants us emotional resilience. It's learning to really appreciate our own character more than external events or other people's opinions of us. That's really, I, I think, what the, the Stoics want to tell us. That's their message. Beautiful way to summarize this session. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, Donald. And for everybody watching, check out the book. It's linked below the video. The social profiles are too. And definitely give Donald a follow. You can learn a lot from him. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.